today I want to see if I can get at least one of these rods on the crank just to make sure everything fits and turns nicely so I've put the block on the engine stand and I've fitted the crankshaft uh, so that's in there and the the front cover is bolted on so that spins seems a little bit tight uh, I'm not sure how freely it should spin with those white metal bearings but it has all been line board to be exact so hopefully that's okay the rods are arrow rods to match the the cranks and they're actually uh, laser engraved so they're numbered so you can keep them all together and I'll also put them in the appropriate positions in the block. I'm not sure if there's a direction on these. I don't think so. Um, I don't think they're handed at all. So I will check that before I do all the final assembly. And these are the, the shells that they use. Um, which I think are from some sort of Ford ZTEC engine. I'm not sure. This is the uh, the box that they came in. But, so that's obviously a modern upgrade for this engine. Uh, normally the big ends would have white metal bearings like the original ones did. So I've actually found in the past getting these apart is reasonably tricky because they're just so well formed. You can't even see where the join line is to get the uh, the big ends off. And uh, you also, on the Riley engine, you have to assemble it from this end. So you have to drop the, the rod in first and then put the piston on the end of the rod because there's no way that the, the big end can fit through the bore of the engine. So you see a lot of these... Um, other YouTube channels where they're building the big American V8s and they don't have that problem because the piston diameter is so big they can assemble the piston and all the rings and everything onto the rod and then drop it through from the top of the block and seat it down on the on the crank pins um, with these old British engines you can't do that because you can't fit them through that way so they have to go through the bottom So this is one of the rods with the the end cap taken off. These actually have these sort of little locating tubes, so they fit together really well. The the bearing shells have a little notch that matches a notch in the connecting rod. So when you assemble them, those those notches have to go in together. And even though this is just a test fit, I am putting oil on everything. I don't want to assemble anything dry. Um, eventually it'll all get completely cleaned off. And uh, then I will go back through and re when, when the final reassembly time comes, I'll use assembly lube on it. But this should now be ready to, to do a test drop down into the bore. And I'll see if it fits on the, the crank pin okay. You can see how the, the connecting rod that's down in the bore. And you can see how it's, it's too big to fit through. Which is why you, you can't drop it through from the other side. You have to fit them from this side. Uh, and then put the pistons on last. I've attached the, the first connecting rod just to see if it would actually fit and the crank can rotate and it can. Um, while I was doing that to protect the inside of the bores, which I am going to give a light hone, uh, hone to before I fully reassemble everything, uh, I used some of the, the sort of packing material that the rods came in and I just put a bit of that over the, over the little ends just because I didn't want it scraping up and down in the bore. But you can see one of the difficulties in assembling this engine now, 
which is this this rod is actually at top dead center that's as high as it'll go so you have to remember to push the rod through the block and then you have to uh, before you put the big end on uh, the big end cap on you actually have to fit the piston and put the the, um, the gudgeon pin through before you actually bolt the crank to the rod because otherwise there's no way to get to the the pin there so I do remember when I took this apart this is the the number one piston um, with the the crank unbolted or the rod unbolted from the crank and pushed all the way up the piston ends up sitting about there so you can just get the pin through so I haven't done that in this case because I first wanted to check that this would bolt up and I want to test it with some plastic gauge which is this stuff just to see what the clearances are um, I, I can't imagine that there's any problem with the clearance given this is a, a crank and rod set that came from one place and they make precision cranks and rods but it's worth checking and this stuff's fun to play with anyway so I'm gonna check that just to make sure and uh, I guess I should check all of them uh, to be really sure and I'll see what the differences are so you can see now looking at this upside down this is with the the rod disconnected from the crank and it has to sit all the way down on the bottom of the cylinder so that it'll stick through far enough that you can then push the piston in and get the pin through it so I'm going to plastic gauge this now um, I think I might fit the rest of the rods and do them all at once and uh, see what sort of values I get now one interesting thing about this uh, these rods is they use these ARP bolts and these have to be tightened up very specifically and I've had to, had to order a stretch gauge that'll let me make sure that these are torqued up completely so this is uh, why the, the bolts have a dimple either end so you can actually get a, an accurate measurement, measurement of the stretch so I think I'm going to have to look up what the story is with the plastic gauge um, I think it should be good enough just to to nip this up so it's tight but not actually torqued anywhere near the final spec because I don't want to over torque the bolts and the whole point of torquing them to that specific value in the stretch is that the the bolts themselves do stretch and it puts them under under tension a bit like a spring and that's what stops them from coming undone is that tension so I think for the plastic gauge it's enough that I just do these up so that they're they're sort of hand tight which means the two halves of the uh, the connecting rod are tight to compress the plastic gauge to show me what sort of measurement I'm getting inside there this is the plastic gauge after I've Put the the cap back on and tightened it up but I didn't torque it up to the full torque uh, this that's where this all gets tricky because you have to do that with the stretch gauge so I don't know what that is yet um, and I only really want to be doing that on the final assembly so I just sort of nipped it up tight um, just so it felt like all the clearance between the, the rod and the cap was taken up maybe that's not good enough but I can't imagine it makes too much difference to the the final reading on this but the idea is once it's sort of squished up like that you compare it to the the gauge here and you find the width that is the closest match um, to see what sort of clearance you've got and it's a bit hard to see so you're also meant to do this without rotating the crank 
um, because that makes it move. I found that really hard to do. It's, it's just an awkward engine to be able to do this on. Uh, it's also very awkward to film, but I don't know, that's looking pretty much like 2000 clearance to me. Um, I don't actually know what it should be. So doing that hasn't really told me anything. Uh, so I need to look that up. That sounds sort of sensible, I guess. Um, you obviously need some clearance there because that's where the oil goes. Um, so there's an oil film between the, the crank pin and the bearing, which is why, of course, there are all these holes in the thing to, uh, to get the oil to go everywhere. So I think really all I've proved there is, one, that this is really fiddly to do on this particular engine, and two, the clearance is there, and it's probably exactly what it should be. But like I say, when you, when you buy these not cheap um, modern crankshafts and rods and, and shells and things as a set, you'd expect them to be correct. I don't know what you're supposed to do if it isn't correct. Um, you know, the, with, a, with a new new things like this, what would you do? Send it back to them and say, no, it's not within spec, uh, which for me would be a major pain in the neck because it would mean sending things back to the UK. That's not cheap. Um, so maybe doing this only really makes sense for people who are building reconditioned engines where you've had the crank ground and you want to check that it's all actually been machined correctly and the parts you've got are all working together properly. But it was probably worth doing this just to make sure maybe I'm being too pedantic or maybe I'm not pedantic enough. I really don't know. The, the caps are such a tight fit on the rods because everything's so well machined. I found the only way to easily get them off, and I have to do this in the, in the block as well, is to loosen the bolts and then gently tap them with the, the nylon hammer there just to, um, to knock the, the cap loose. So this is the, the number four rod. I'm going to fit that one next since the engine's in already in the right position. And what I've found is I, I need to use a, a stick to basically push the, the connecting rod up the bore um, to get it so it comes up and I can put the cap on. It's all a bit fiddly. Uh, it's important to make sure that the, the caps stay with the correct rod and also the right way around. These ones are labeled so you can see the H2 there which makes it easy but the other way to tell is the the notches both go on the same side. So you can see the little notches there which is what the shells clip into uh, to stop them moving and both of those notches are on the same side of the rod. That's what I'm wondering about in terms of which way round should the rods go in the engine with the notches on this side of the engine or should they go around the other way on that side of the engine. And with these sort of rods, does not matter? Because I'm pretty sure they're symmetrical. But it's another little detail I'll, I'll have to, to figure out. I'm assuming whatever way they go, you should just be consistent. The other little detail I can't remember uh, when it comes to assembling engines is when you assemble it, should you put oil between the outside of the shell and the inside of the cap or not? Um, I've built a couple of engines before and I honestly can't remember. So... It's another one of those things I, I need to look up. Uh, for what I'm doing now, it doesn't matter because this is all going to come apart again. Uh, it's all going to get cleaned down and brake cleaner um, because I have to I have to strip it all down t to send it all off for balancing. Uh, it's only on the final assembly that all that kind of stuff becomes important. I ended up 
doing that multiple times just to make sure I was getting consistent results. And I am getting 2,000 clearance on each of them. And the rods all move on the journals, as you'd expect. Uh, and the crank does turn. There's quite a lot of stiction there, though. Uh, it's getting easier now. I've got oil in there for everything. Um, the other trick I use to make sure I can't mess up the end caps of the, the rods and pistons is I only ever disassemble one at a time. So I don't take them all apart, get them all ready, because then there's a chance you could mess up the, the caps. So I only remove one of them at a time and uh, unbolt it, do what I need to do, bolt it back together to make sure that they stay matched. Like I say on these, it's not too bad because it's laser marked on them which ones go together. But on old cars, this is one of the original rods. Uh, these are stamped, but often you'll also find, yeah, you can sort of see it there. People put punch marks on things. So there's little punch marks on these, which if you're lucky, they, the punch marks all kind of line up. Yeah, these ones have been stamped with numbers, which helps. Um, I don't know what that number is, the 2195, but see this one also has some punch marks on there. And over time, nobody knows what those, those mean anymore. Uh, the other thing I was going to point out, which I completely forgot to do before I put the rods in the in the block, is those new rods are actually three millimeters longer than these original ones, which means I'll get slightly higher compression. But it also means the the piston comes three millimeters or an eighth of an inch further up, um, which effectively would turn this into an interference engine, which means the uh, the, the valves would hit the pistons. So what I'm going to need to do is, once I've got all this assembled and got the pistons in place and I know how far up the bores they come, uh, I'm going to have to to mark those and then you machine a 45 degree flat on the, on the piston to clear the inlet valve and the exhaust valve. So I do have the mill and I do have the fly cutter I made, so I should be able to do that. But I'm going to need to figure out the best way to how you actually mount these things, how you hold them, so that you can do that. And the, the pistons go in that way. Uh, so the gudgeon pins are in line with the crank, which means I need to machine this face and this face so I don't know if I'll have to make up some sort of jig or if you can just clamp it in blocks is going to be enough uh, I'll have to ask people how they how they do that so the pistons are all numbered so I know which piston comes out of which bore but this engine was assembled many many years ago and they never run so um, I will put it back together in the same order, but I don't think it's really going to matter because these have never been run. These were new pistons. So as long as the bores are the correct diameter and I'm going to use my, um, my ball hone thing just to clean them up. They still actually have the, the machining marks in them. I'm not sure where it is. Somewhere I've got the, the right tool to do that, just to give the the bores a nice hone, and uh, then I should be able to to fit everything. Uh, the, one of the problems I was having with the plastic gauge is they say you don't want the con rod to move uh, or the uh, connecting rod to move on the con rod while you're trying to compress it, and without the pistons in place, that's actually really hard to do. So that's why I had to do it multiple times to try and get some sort of consistent reading. So really I need to do that again once the pistons are in place because with a piston in there, 
obviously this can't flap around at all and it's easy to lock the crank in one position so that this won't move when you're trying to compress it to get the the plaster gauge to squish up so that's probably enough for tonight um, I may sound a bit croaky I've actually had a cold a bad cold for the last well, three or four days and I'm still just getting over that um, and it's getting dark now so I should probably go in but it's good to finally be doing stuff in this in the new garage in the new shed so I'm slowly getting it sorted out I've been putting things up on the wall that's all my flare obviously you have to have at least 15 pieces of flare so I've got a little way to go um, I ordered a bunch of magnetic hooks which are quite good for for hanging things up when you've got a, a tin shed so I may have to get a whole bunch more of those but I'm going to cover all of this up for now. Um, I've got dust cloths on everything and try to keep everything nice and clean. I'm going to have to get hold of a lot more brake clean for when I actually hone this thing out. And I want to make sure it's all absolutely spotless before I assemble it, of course. Uh, the crank still really needs a good clean because it's still got all of its packing, packing type stuff on it. And I also have to remember that there's two threaded holes in the, uh, the front and the rear of this down in here and the the crank itself came with doc documentation and in that packet of documentation are the two little grub screws that need to go in there so I have to remember to put those in otherwise I imagine oil leaks out everywhere but that's a little bit of progress it's kind of interesting where we are because we're supposedly in a little microclimate sort of weather bubble where the weather here is always slightly better than all the area around us so it's a pretty miserable day today and it did rain overnight but it's not raining here but you can sort of see back in the hills there in the middle it's raining over there which is heading south towards Waikanae and Parapara Umu That way is kind of over towards the beach. There's bad weather and clouds all around us. Ah, but it's nice. Just above where we are. Well, it does rain sometimes. <laughs> 